and welcome to The Contrarians, where we're right and you're wrong. Before we get to the show, let's get the pleasantries out of the way. First of all, our website. If you want more information about our little podcast, go to wearethecontrarians.com. That's where you'll find links to our old episodes, to our Patreon channel, and to our awesome Contrarians merch. You can show your support by buying a Contrarians mug or a pillow. I like the laptop bags myself. Second of all, if you enjoy the show, tell your friends. Or even go a step further and leave us a five-star review on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. Finally, if you want to reach out directly to us, that's what social media is for. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at Contrarian Prime, or check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Contrarian Prime. Julio runs our official Twitter account at Contrarian Prime, but if you want to give me a piece of your mind or just want to banter about pro wrestling, you can follow me at Contrarian Alex. That's it. That's our intro. Now, time for the show. This is our And we are recording for Contrarian's Corner for He Is Just Not That Into You. The big finale for the Friends Stravaganza. Hello and welcome back to The Contrarians, where we're right and you're wrong. My name is Alex, joined as always by my co-host and friend Julio. Julio, it's been a long and winding road of both the fresh and the rotten. Today we're kind of meeting in the middle. <laughs> as, as it happens from time to time, there's a... Uh, what are these? They're not like fully rotten tomatoes. They're not fully fresh tomatoes. What are they? Are they like squishy? I just think they're of like Kramer. They, they're day olds. <laughs> they're, uh... <laughs> they're day olds. There you go. Uh, such is the case of today's movie. A day old. A Jennifer Aniston day old to mm-hmm. boot. A Ken Quapis old. God, finally. <laughs> We've been talking about Ken Quapis almost as long as we've been talking about Josh Gad on this show. And uh, I don't know why. I don't really, know, just, I don't really yeah. know why. Yeah. <laughs> we just joke about that movie License to Wed a lot. And it just seems like he made just the mil- most milk toast shit during the time we worked at the theater. It was License to Wed, <laughs> this, and uh, Big Miracle. <laughs> There's just something about the name, maybe. You know, it's a cool name, Quapis. So you don't hear that often. And I, I know on my end, Alex, it's just the pure joy that it brings me that I can say King Quapis and you know exactly who I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just uh, that doesn't happen anywhere else. Yeah, man. That was, I, you know, I was watching Malcolm in the Middle and recently an episode came up that was directed by him. I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, we're wrapping up the Friends Stravaganza. We've come to Rachel. Uh, Julio, you've designated Rachel the main event. And obviously, Jennifer, Jennifer Aniston has a um, a bigger filmography to choose from than any of the other friends. But I can't remember what the, the deciding factor was on this, but I'm glad we got to this. It was probably me saying we should do this because it's um, – which episode number are we on? Because we're, we're ending this with a, a – 160. 160. That's right. And as those of you longtime listeners know – Every increment of 10, we do what we call a gray area episode where it's kind of in the middle here. So it just worked out perfectly. Of course, on the chopping block was, uh, what did we have up there? Um, I mean, office the, space. Yep. The options were endless. Rockstar. The the Good Girl. Was that that movie with her mm-hmm. in it? Yeah. Picture Perfect. Any number of Adam Sandler joints. No, she was just in one. I, just go with it. That's what it was. Just go with it. Yeah, I was confusing uh, Drew Barrymore. What's the one with Paul Rudd? Oh, is that Wonderlust? Oh, that's also with Paul Rudd. Okay, there's not <laughs> the one, the, the one from the '90s, the one where Paul Rudd is her, her gay best friend. I have no idea what you're talking about right now. The object of my affection. Uh, he's gay, she's not, but they're really good friends, and I think they try to raise a child together. It's a movie. It's a Jennifer Aniston movie. That's the whole point. Jennifer Aniston was giving us almost endless possibilities for an episode. So if we were going to have to pick something for a gray area, then it made sense that we would go to the most, to the the friend that gave us the most options. And so that's how we landed on Rachel for the big finale. And I think in a way it's very appropriate, right? Because when you look at her filmography with all its ups and downs, Jennifer Aniston's filmography, uh, looking back at the journey that we've been in with, the other cast members' filmographies, it makes sense that we would end here, you know, with the 
the friend that has made the most movies, and I think arguably, and we can get into this in, in real talk, arguably actually developed a film career. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. She's definitely like the one that from the cast of Friends you think of as a movie star. Yep. Yep. Despite she may have the least range of any of them. But you watch your mouth. <laughs> she was the chosen one, I guess. It's too early. We're like, what, five minutes into recording, Alex? It's too early for us to start fighting. <laughs> so, yeah, Ken Quapis. He's he, he's who we are here to discuss today. The Quapis Vaganza. I helped launch the show The Office, and I'm actually very happy to report that next month I'm, I'm going to uh, direct the 100th episode of the show. So quite a milestone for the show. Okay, that's... All right, so if this is your first time joining us here on The Contrarians, thank you so much for doing so. Uh, For returning listeners, give us just a moment here while we explain what it is we do to any and all potential uh, rookies out there. So here on The Contrarians, we like to rage against the Rotten Tomatoes machine. That is our battle cry. Find a movie on Rotten Tomatoes that is highly rated, a lot of times known as certified fresh. Uh, What we'll do with that is bring that movie down just a few pegs, talk about maybe some of the aspects of it that are overrated, uh, that critics you know focused on uh, a bit too much and in light of pushing others under the rug, uh, poor acting, directing choices, poor score, things of that nature. Uh, conversely, we'll find a movie on Rotten Tomatoes that is lowly rated, usually about 30% and below. Usually, uh, one of those nasty green splotches is what we shoot for. And uh, as you could imagine, we'll make a case for that film's positive merit. Maybe some bold directing, screenwriting, acting, uh, great music, score, you know, just things that we can find to celebrate in that film, all in an attempt to prove that art is subjective. You can be as over the moon about something or as cynical about something if you really set your mind to it as you want to be. Uh, And that also Rotten Tomatoes, them scores, y'all don't always tell the whole story. So we are here to kind of flush that out for you. Uh, But that all comprises the first portion of the podcast, uh, what we refer to as Contrarian's Corner. Julio, if listeners want to know how we really feel about the movie we're discussing, they just have to hang around to the second half. That's correct. The second half of the show, aptly titled Real Talk, part two, right there on your feeds. That's where we stop worrying about the Run Tomato score, and we just tell you how we felt while we're watching the movie. This one I watched a long time ago with my wife. Uh, Alex, sounds like you've seen it at least once before. I saw it in the theater, baby. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> was this a, a Jennifer Goodwin uh, effect? I'm trying to remember if I screened it or went and saw it with whoever I was dating at the time, but I know I saw it in the theater. I, yeah, well, dude, the trailer was a fucking banger. It was. Was uh, it? <laughs> yeah, because it, it had that Cure song in it, "Friday I'm in Love," and it was the also song that closes the movie. Also important to keep in mind, this was before like Valentine's Day and New Year's Eve and those movies came out that were just all stunt casting. Like it's like, hey, let's cram as many assholes into this movie as we possibly can. <laughs> so it was like, hmm, <laughs> this seems intriguing. We could have just King called it White Pe- came up with it. <laughs> White people the movie. Uh, <laughs> but the whole gimmick had not been completely trampled and sullied yet as this movie doesn't even have a holiday to to just circle (laughs) all its characters around it's just uh, and you know what this movie did uh had the good decent common sense to have a release date of february 6 2009 so they got that whole week leading into valentine's day (laughs) and brother it worked out because this baby made 180 million dollars in the theater uh on a budget of 40 so did its part uh to backpedal just a few steps, Julio, since the movie we're covering today is 41% uh, in the middle there. Like I said, every 10 episodes, we cover a gray area, which is usually, I think we do 40 to 60% somewhere in there. Yeah. And So what that means for this episode is that one of us goes on the attack while the other defends in Contrarian's Corner. Julio, my understanding is you will be attacking this one. That's right, because for 150, we did Can't Hardly Wait, and I defended that one and you attacked it so you know we like to we like to swap we like to keep it <laughs> keep it lively here so <laughs> so yeah i'll be attacking this uh this ensemble piece that happens to feature uh, rachel green in one of the main roles and alex will be defending it which makes sense because he's such a romantic so that's going to happen here in Contreras corner and then like we said just stick around for the second half part two where we tell you uh 
how we felt on this rewatch. All right, Julio, 41%. It definitely pleased audiences. Uh, I remember some of the women I worked with at the time at the theater referencing the book it was based on. He's just not that into you uh, by Greg Benrin. Motola. <laughs> yeah. And Liz uh, to, to, to Kilo to Celio. I don't know, man. Sorry, <laughs> Greg and Liz. I'm fucking up y'all's names here, but yes, based off a self-improvement book that hopefully has the uh, narrative and, bullying tone of justin long in this movie <laughs> that'd be funny if all his shit is just verbatim lifted from the book <laughs> yeah the, fuck what's a uh, smart people where the they try to transcribe and like put the dennis quaid's tone into it and the name of the book is you can't read because he's just <laughs> such a fucking asshole uh <laughs> all right so what uh what were critics saying about this Okay, uh, just to keep with the gimmick, you know, I have a, a couple of uh, rotten quotes, a couple of fresh quotes, and then we'll have more on part two. Let's start with a rotten one from Ali Gray from the theshiznit.uk, who says, He's just not that into you, it's just insultingly average in every way, spending 129 minutes telling us what we already know. Girls and boys don't always click. 129 okay. minutes, Alex. Yeah, this runtime uh, did not feel that long, to be quite honest with you. Because <laughs> you, you're supposed to divide the 129 minutes between the, I don't know, 20 main actors that you have? <laughs> yeah, I guess that's fair. Richard Probes from the independentcritic.com says, this is a fresh one. He says, Quapis gives the film the perfect blend of heart, humor, and emotional connection. I was just happy that they, they gave Ken Quapis a shout out, like official. Like we're going to name the director. God bless. I mean, it's like, I don't know how often they say, hey, did you watch Ken Quapis's He's Just Not That Into You? <laughs> you know, they might say Jennifer Aniston's He's Just Not That Into You. That's like the water cooler talk. It's like someone, you know, goes in. It's like, man, I saw this movie, Bradley Cooper. Fucker, cheating on his wife, right? Brings her into his office. Wife shows up, has sex with him, and his mistress is in the closet. And then, you know, the guy is just like, oh, yeah, that's that new Ken Quapis movie. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, speaking of Ken Quapis, he also gets called out in the Rotten Reviews. Uh, Shubra Gupta from the Indian Express says, what's surprising is how many marquee names Ken Quapis has lined up for these regurgitated romantic lectures on when to know when someone is into someone. If I was Ken Quapis, I would just be happy that my name is popping up on the reviews. Oh, yeah. That's just, you know, those Google alerts just keep you alive. And then let's close with Lee Patch from the Herald Sun, Australia, who says, How could anything starring Jennifer Aniston, Scarlett Johansson, Drew Barrymore, and Jennifer Connelly not possibly work? That's a fresh one. Like She's saying, of course it works, because it has these four extremely talented actresses. I take um, major umbrage with putting Jennifer Aniston in the same classes as other three. Oh, God, Alex, we're, we're going to clash hard in real talk. I can tell. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think this provides an excellent segue into uh, more Jennifer Aniston talk that doesn't come from either of us. Yes, one of our good friends out in the podcasting universe has been so kind as to uh, kind of supplement us along the way with his knowledge of friends. It it appears to be even more expansive than yours, Julio. So uh, I think uh, now is the right time to set the stage one last time uh, with a, a friend's character profile. All right. Take it away, Billy. Hello, listeners of The Contrarians. It's me once again, your boy B. Dizzle, with a little bit of friend schooling for you. This week, we're talking about none other than Rachel Green as played by Jennifer Aniston. I must say that every time I watch Friends, I forget what a tremendous actress Jennifer Aniston truly is. Her comic timing is outstanding. Rachel Green was Monica Geller's best friend in high school. She's a snotty brat whose parents have supported her through life. The series really starts with Rachel as our 
into this group as she just arrives in New York on her wedding day, leaving her husband, and contacts Monica because she's the only person she knows in the city. From here, Rachel moves into Monica's apartment and really learns how to be a real person. She cuts off her parents' finances and becomes a waitress at the Central Perk. While everybody thinks of Ross and Rachel as the ongoing thing, people often forget that there were a good two or three seasons where Rachel and Joey were an honest-to-God thing. As far as my memory serves, they're the only two friends, apart from the now-married couples of Ross and Rachel and Chandler and Monica, who ever hooked up. Rachel's real goal in life is to work in fashion, and it's a goal that she actually kind of falls into pretty easily at the start of the show. After working as a waitress for a couple of episodes, she lands a job at Bloomingdale's and eventually at Ralph Lauren. Now, while Rachel obviously has her pros, she's very funny, she's very smart, she is the worst friend. There's no around it. She is a bad person. She just doesn't care. She's just very selfish. And although she learns and grows throughout the course of the show, it's just never truly redeemed. She's also an in to some great guest stars in the show. Her sisters are played in various episodes by Christina Applegate and and Reese Witherspoon, both giving tremendous performances. And in a classic Thanksgiving episode, Ross's old high school friend, Brad Pitt, comes to town as the head of the I Hate Rachel fan club. And this was while they were married. <laughs> With all that said, as mentioned, Rachel is my sixth ranked friend. Thanks so much for listening to The Contrarians, and thanks for listening to my voice for these last 90-odd seconds. Now it's back to the good stuff. <laughs> Man, I didn't realize that Billy was ranking them on, like, how good a friend they were. <laughs> He's taking it quite literally. And yeah, yeah, before we go any further, massive shout out to Billy for the stuff he supplied us along the way. It's really given um, the friend Stravaganza a unique feel with his knowledge and uh, way more analytical thoughts on the, the show than I would have. Yes, it was a it's it's a nice a uh, little bit of prestige on top of the French extravaganza. <laughs> it's like the the criterion introduction. Yes, the the director introduction. It's the the uh, liner notes. Yes, yes. I'm trying to think of the <laughs> the word, but the the, the essay that's yes. submitted for the why this deserves inclusion type thing. <laughs> yes, Billy. Thank you. Even though uh, your ranking is whack, man. Uh, this is where I say Rachel is my second favorite friend. I think that uh, she's second only to Chandler. Cool, man. <laughs> Based on what you've said, I guess. Okay, do you do you have issue with Jennifer Aniston or with Rachel or with both? That's all she is. She's Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, we can establish that 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 applies to most friends. Uh, yeah, but then like. No one else has tried to tell me that Matthew Perry is a great actor, and I'm supposed to believe it. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's a reason why her filmography is like four times the the size of uh, the other five. I guess she's just a chosen one. It's like the Julia <laughs> Roberts thing. They just like people in Hollywood decided this person uh, is who we're gonna you know use, and to be fair. That has to connect somewhere. That means that people continue to pay to see it. It's like the Julia Roberts thing, though. Just like, why? I mean, sometimes it just doesn't happen. You know, see Sam Worthington? <laughs> Hell yeah. Let's get that jab in. <laughs> uh, all right, Alex. So let's, let's go into Contreras Corner. Because uh, I I guess if, if I'm going to have to say mean things about this movie and by extension, Jennifer Aniston, I, I need to I need to get started so I can get it out of the way. You don't ever feel like we're going against nature by not getting married? No. Going against nature is like the cat who suckled that monkey. All right. So, yeah, this is an ensemble cast movie, so there's a lot of bouncing around to get to. Um, so I feel the best way to start off, one, besides the, the beautiful New Line uh, signature that starts off this movie, Jennifer Goodwin starts us off with some narration in this movie. Julio, it felt like at certain points 
it was speaking to the struggles of women predominantly, but it also brings up things with men. So I appreciate that. I felt like it started off, I was worried, you know, as a man that isn't heard nearly enough in today's society that this movie was going to uh, cast out my voice. And I was happy to see that it's still in there throughout it. Uh, I mean, if that voice is the voice of a terrible person, then yes, I, I agree that Ken Kwapis and uh, his team, they don't really discriminate men, women, gay, straight, like everybody here is uh, a terrible person. And I, I think that that's one of the messages of the movie. As long is, as they're white, you got to keep that in mind. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Okay. There is one one clear uh, point of discrimination is like the cast and Luis Guzman. <laughs> that's the divide. Yes. Um, but th- there is, I guess, the message of the movie, and it, it, it's just repeated throughout the throughout the entire length of you know this little bit over two hours, is that it's hard to find love. Probably because we're all such assholes, and I, I don't know. I mean, that's not news. And then certainly didn't need you know almost 130 minutes of that news flash. Did you really? Did you identify with anybody in this movie, Alex? <laughs> Bradley Cooper. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe Chris Christopherson because he just wanted everyone to shut up so he could eat and drink. I, I really <laughs> and die. I, I appreciate and respect that. And, uh, I mean, Neil, Ben Affleck, to a certain extent, of just... I'll suffer in silence. <laughs> ...being so stubborn and set in his ways that he won't, like, give an inch for anybody else. I can definitely relate to that. I mean, I already shouted him out, but, of course, I'm Luis Guzman. Just... <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> a lone immigrant. Just getting by- <laughs> berated by white people. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so, who do we start off with here? Gigi, Jennifer Goodwin. Man. Why isn't she in more things? I feel like she had like a moment around here. That's killed her career. (laughs) You just answered my question. Never mind. (laughs) But Jennifer Goodwin, would you consider her the main character in this movie? I understand we're an ensemble cast, but it really feels like her story is the one we see the complete arc of. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, we open with her voiceover. We close with her voiceover. I mean, if we have to, yes. In a way, though, this movie is just about one character and that character is broken up into (laughs) several different actors i think that if you add up everybody together all the characters here they make up maybe one three-dimensional being but yeah definitely out of all the fragments yeah jeffrey goodwin is the one that we get to see the most of she is really dumb (laughs) in this movie she's she's trying and I mean that in like the sense of she's a if I was describing her, I'd say, well, she's she's very trying of my patience. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I thought you meant like she's a good actress that's trying to make sense of this character they've that she's been given. Oh no. She's a great actress and she's too good at this role. It was like making me uncomfortable at points. <laughs> they make you feel guilty. Like you're like, oh man, my entire gender has been mistreating her. Jennifer Goodwin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, due to the confusing, uh, convoluted nature of this movie, I feel it best to hit up our good friends at Wikipedia. The The movie begins with the, the trio of Gigi, Connor, and Alex. In Baltimore, Gigi repeatedly misre- misreads the romantic interests of her dates. Following a tepid date with real estate agent Connor Barry, this is played by Kevin Connolly, returning to the Contrarians podcast. Massive red flag. <laughs> One of the guys from Entourage shows up in a romantic comedy. Gigi is befriended by bar owner Alex, who suggests she misinterprets romantic signals as their friendship continues. Gigi interprets his helpfulness as a sign he is attracted to her, but Alex rebuffs her, chastising her for ignoring his advice. Uh, Alex, of course, played not by myself, but uh, (laughs) Justin Long. To remind you, uh, if you're in a movie, this guy is he owns his own bar and like restaurant and is this person that intimidates other people. He's it's, a ladies man in this movie. Yeah. I Justin mean, Long. Really? Come on. <laughs> you had the money to hire Affleck, Aniston, fuck even Kevin Connolly. You couldn't. I mean, I, OK, so if you like Justin Long, just cast him in a different part. Make Affleck the ladies man. It just it doesn't. He looks like a little boy. Did did you buy him as as this guy that was with a different woman every day and had like all the 
the knowledge of decades of interpersonal relationships between men and women, like stored in his brain, just able to dispense advice whenever somebody needed it. That's yes. not what I think of when I think Justin Long. Do you? Julio, you obviously have not spent enough time around like women that just flock to the most febile, like <laughs> wienery type men. And I think that's what Justin <laughs> Long nails here. And I think it was a great casting call. There are so many people like in college in my early 20s, I'd be just looking at him like this guy, really? But that's <laughs> he nails that that aura there. It's like this. He's the fucking goofball from Live Free or Die Hard. You're going yes. home with this guy. <laughs> And he pulls Busy Phillips, so you know right away he means business. <laughs> you know right away that this is just, it's fantasy. There's no way. Uh, he, I, I don't know, like I kept hoping that it would be just that he had money. It, and I kept waiting for him to do something that was just an overt display of how much money he had. And then everything would click. But no, I mean, he, other than owning his own business, it, it didn't really feel like, you know, we never see him drive, like, I don't know, a really fancy sports car or... I don't know, you know, tip really well. <laughs> it's just, he's just a dude. He like, he's like a nerd. I, I couldn't believe. And Jennifer Goodwin, I mean, man, at least, you know, cast somebody that's less of a, like Jennifer Goodwin, she is, what was she coming from? Like, was she like in Big Love? This was post Big Love, right? Walk the line. Walk the line. So she's already like a, a movie star and and Justin Long is you know he's still like a nerdy guy so you, it doesn't match you needed to cast somebody that would be more of an outcast and then I would totally buy that that she's going for for this guy that maybe you know talks a good game he got cast because they thought well fuck we have to find someone who's slightly more intimidating than Kevin Connolly and they're like oh <laughs> get me Justin Long <laughs> <laughs> that's how they started so so the bottom like the the last rung of the ladder was Kevin Connolly, and then they kind of like kept climbing the ladder until they reached like what's what's peak alpha maleness in this movie. They, they went one rung above Jay Baruchel and called Justin Long, <laughs> and then they kept climbing the ladder until they got to what B Coop or or Affleck, who's like the top dog there. Oh, uh, B Coop's having sex with Scarlett Johansson and Jennifer Connolly in this, so I'll. I, well, Affleck's I, doing the dishes. Yeah, for real. Affleck just lo- looking like a bitch over here while B Coop's just <laughs> slinging meat all across town. <laughs> but, of course, the, the movie rightly shows you what that gets you. And <laughs> in one case, it's happiness for the rest of your life. In the other, it's a six-pack and a pack of gum. <laughs> he still looks like Bradley Cooper. I think he's going to be okay, Alex. Oh, yeah, he'll he'll be fine. Yeah, I have a note here that said, God, this is such a movie, and movie is in all caps. And that's not a bad thing. Like, I could, f- like, the sound it, and... It's, it's fine that it's a movie, Alex. It, it's, I don't have a problem with it being a movie. In fact, it's it's good to have a movie. I, I think that we need more movies that are just movies, right? But the problem is that this movie in particular thinks that it's saying something about relationships, and that's where I take issue with it. It's constructed as if it's meant to be insightful. Like you're supposed to leave this movie thinking that you've learned something about how men and women relate to each other. And that's not the case. <laughs> but the way that this movie gives you like the title cards and the the every I would say every 15 to 20 minutes, the movie will stop so that a couple of characters can have dialogue that's not really dialogue, but it's more like stand-up comedian like observations, like Seinfeld going like, you know, the funny thing about relationships is, and then he'll go on and say like something like, uh, So, are, are you here as like a guest or like his date? Oh, I hate that. When you don't know if you're a date, so you don't know if you should like bring a friend or are you like co-hosting or should you stay to the end to have some alone time? And then they go on and on, and I'm like, what happened? This is not like, that. this is not how people talk. But it's like, oh, we're going to go on this little rant so that we can uh, impart wisdom, make like observational humor. This is uh, just, just be a movie. Just be a movie. Just tell me a story. Don't, don't try to like preach to me about, about life. Did you learn anything watching this, Alex? Don't lock your mistress in your closet while you're having sex with your wife. <laughs> but you should have known this already. <laughs> <laughs> you would think it's common sense. I'm, I'm married. I don't do this. Yeah, we start to get the intertwinings of stories here. We see that uh, Kevin Connolly was smitten with Scarlett Johansson. Uh, we have the meet cute with her and Bradley Cooper. 
We go to uh, Benifer, Ben Affleck, Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> Different Benifer. We get the discussion of like, you know, she wants marriage, he doesn't. It starts to, to kick off that way. We see here uh, also something that I completely forgot about this movie is that uh, it plays these the trope that the first few episodes of Sex in the City have, where it brings up, a, it poses a question, and then it interviews random townspeople. Uh, and they're talking to the camera as though it was like a documentary about the question that's being asked. And it's like, if he's not calling you, and my note says, oh, the original Sex in the City trope. <laughs> For those of you all who haven't watched Sex in the City, they did that in the first maybe five or six episodes. Um, they, they realized it was a terrible idea. <laughs> this movie doesn't no this movie like capitalized on that because it is a good idea for something like this for a show that is consistently evolving it you're going to run out of questions to ask for a two-hour movie you got five questions i think you'll be all right did you recognize any of the people in in those little breakup segments was i supposed to julio i don't think no, so but i wish that we had this is the perfect opportunity to give me some cameos give me like gilbert gottfried uh <laughs> jeff daniels you know, just talking about love. Instead, they got some people. The One of the guys, the guy that says, oh, you know, there's some women that they'll go out with you and they'll never have sex with you. And this is how I, I've learned to spot them, you know. And, and he lists, like, different ways that you can spot, like, a girl that's going to make you wait to have sex. That dude looks like he's reading cue cards. I was like, get an actor. <laughs> Why did you get just some random dude that clearly had trouble remembering his dialogue? Get a... Uh, I don't know. Denzel. Can you imagine just like two minutes of Denzel just doing this bit and then walks away? Then that would energize me. Jeez. What to do if he's not calling you? <laughs> Move on. <laughs> Fuck him. <laughs> Finishing our Gigi, Connor, and Alex uh, trifecta. As Gigi moves on from Alex, he realizes he's in love with her after leaving several unanswered voice messages. Alex arrives at Gigi's apartment after she returns from a pleasant date and declares his love, and they end up kissing. So, so this is bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so my notes here about the story just, you know, you would th some people would think they take it too far with the Gigi character in terms of like, girl, get a grip, or just the, the cringe factor of some of the interactions she has with men throughout this. But I think... It's worth it because of the scene where she understands her worth and says, you know, I understand that I may be a bit much, but, you know, I'm closer to finding what I want than you, Justin Long. So <laughs> I think it's an unflinching look at, you know, just the way some people go about finding love. Now, with Justin Long also, I think it's there to... I mean, I wasn't quite on board with it at first, but I'm like, fuck it. He's a, he's a horse that needs taming. And... <laughs> And I think this movie does what it can to tame the wild horse that is Justin Long. <laughs> the stallion that is Justin Long. Uh, no, see, this is, this is a fundamental difference in the way that we appreciate this movie. Because I like, I was not on board with how this story panned out. I, I don't think that Justin Long was in the wrong at all, ever. He was dispensing common sense. I may not find it believable because of the actor, but as far as what he was saying... Uh, it's not just that I believe that he was spot on, like the movie agrees, because the movie always proved them right. And then for Jennifer Goodwin to have the nerve to get mad at him, <laughs> because at one point, well, what he, you know, the truth that he was saying it ended up uh, clashing with her distorted view of reality. If he doesn't want you, you, you know, if he's not into you, he's not going to be into you. That's I, I can get behind that sentiment. Justin Long was the voice of reason in this movie. And when Jennifer Goodwin goes and tells him, you know what, you are too analytical. And that means that you're never going to fall in love. That's bullshit. That is not like that. That position is endorsing uh, irrational actions in the name of love like what i thought the movie was going to be about which was about kind of taking down the myths of uh movie love right like all the romantic notions that we've been uh indoctrinated with with society and media and whatever and just like a realistic way of saying like you know all those happy stories that you hear about well they're the exception because the rule is that you're just gonna make it you're gonna have success in love by hanging out with people that actually show that they love you, not the people that you think might be convinced to love you. 
And then in the last 10 minutes of the movie, it doubles back and it's like, no, just kidding. You can be the exception, like Jennifer Goodwin. <laughs> you can tame the wild stallion that is just in long and show him the error of his ways. He was thinking too much. He just needed to fall in love. Come on. I'm the exception. You are my exception. Hey, man. There's a woman out there for everybody, and sometimes that's just what it takes. And it works in this case. <laughs> To quote Ross, since this is a French extravaganza, I think it's in the first episode. It was like, there's a woman out there for somebody. Unfortunately, uh, for someone else, that woman was my wife. <laughs> I think that's what he says. <laughs> Tremendous. Well, yeah, this might be the main story. It's also like the main offender as far as you know, betraying the values that this movie was supposed to be exhorting. But okay, what else do you have in that that bag of tricks that is the the plot of this movie? So we move on to Janine, Ben, and Anna. Gigi's co-worker, Janine Gunders, obsessed over her home renovations while her husband, Ben, becomes attracted to Anna Marks, a yoga instructor and aspiring singer. So this is Jennifer Connelly, Bradley Cooper, and Scarlett Johansson, respectively. Ben and Anna pursue a flirtatious friendship under the pretense of him helping her establish a singing career. Ah, poor naive ScarJo. Ben reveals that he only married Janine after she delivered an ultimatum saying they should marry or break up. Ben agrees to only be friends with Anna, but she continues her pursuit until they sleep together. Finding cigarette butts hidden in the backyard, Janine accuses Ben of smoking again, citing her father's death from lung cancer. Ben blames the workmen at their house. During a tense home improvement shopping trip, Ben confesses his infidelity. Devastated, Janine blames herself and wants to save their marriage. Ben seems less enthusiastic. So a couple things to cover here. Yeah, we've got uh, the Bradley Cooper, Scarlett Johansson relationship budding here. And again, uh, you know, it's not something I'm happy to report, but there is a lot of infidelity out there in the world. And these situations really do happen. Uh this is this approaches though the the shit like it feels like Bradley Cooper wrote this like uh, John Favreau and <laughs> Chef. Is it Sofia Vergara? Yep. And Scarlett Johansson, yeah, yep. are, are pining for his affection. Um, Cooper is such a dick in this. That's great. Like in the sense of he tries to act noble and be above it all. Uh, whereas, yeah, it's pretty clear what Scarlett Johansson's intentions are. Uh, Jennifer Conley. Is this her first time on The Contrarians? The Dilemma. Yes. I always forget about The Dilemma, which is an underrated fine piece of business. Uh, But here, the lying about smoking, you know, I will fault the movie for this. It builds Bradley Cooper up as the guy like, all right, it looks like this guy's got his shit together and knows what he's doing, at least from like, you know, just being a cool guy type of thing. And then you find out he smokes fucking American spirits and it's <laughs> completely kills the illusion. It's when, in one of the scenes, uh, Ben Affleck owes him, uh, offers him, excuse me, a marble red kind of like, come on, be a real man type of thing. <laughs> um, these are the two worst people in the movie. I think, uh, Scar Joe and B Coop. And I give ScarJo the edge as far as like be the absolute worst. Um, I mean, B Coop is no angel, and he's also a terrible person. But ScarJo, she knows, right? Like she owns mirrors, so she knows what she looks like, and she sees Bradley Cooper teetering on the brink of cheating on his wife, and. He says, he puts up his hands and he's like, I can't, I'm married. And then she thinks about it for like maybe five seconds and she's like, fuck it. I want to destroy this marriage. I don't care. Like she literally, she decides that she doesn't care. Like, yeah, okay. So Drew Barrymore kind of like nudges her in that direction. But end of the day, she's the one that calls first. Like if, if Scarlett Johansson hadn't called, like Bradley Cooper would still be happily married and that house would be fully renovated maybe they'll have a kid by now um but scarlett johansson gets this this ball rolling because they had like their meet cute and then they walk away and no harm's been done yet and then scarlett johansson takes action hello 
Hey, Ben, uh, this is Anna Marks. Hey, Anna. Uh, what's up? Nothing. I was just, um, I was taking you up on your offer. I know you said you had, um, a couple of contacts you thought could help me, and, um, I thought maybe we could talk about it over coffee or something like that. This is just not even taking the, the into consideration how she's constantly taking advantage of, uh, Kevin Connolly. This is just yes. like just just looking at the Bradley Cooper side of it. She is a terrible person, and then Bradley Cooper is also an asshole. Like, is he at at some point you just realize, okay, now he's he he does want to cheat. He's just prolonging the <laughs> the the wait. He's a what uh, Tom Cruise calls in Vanilla Sky a pleasure delayer. You know, he's like we're gonna make make this last. Uh, so two terrible people, and which would be great if the movie didn't expect me to feel bad for them. But by the time that their story is done, I kind of felt like the movie was telling me, isn't it sad where they ended up? Like, don't you feel bad for them? And I don't. <laughs> they deserved everything they got and and worse. Do you feel bad for them? Not terribly. One of my notes on the movie is, am I supposed to feel bad for B Coop? But uh, I think that's kind of its charm. The movie that is, is it kind of leaves it up to the the audience's interpretation to their their vantage point to their experiences you know uh and in this process where ben blames the uh the workman of the house this is where we get a wild louis guzman he appears my notes just say louis guzman in all caps splash of color in the white canvas that is he's just not that into you yes (laughs) that that is absolutely no lie (laughs) It's so it's one of the most awkward scenes in the movie because Jennifer Connelly, who's been a fairly balanced character up till now, a hundred percent becomes an entitled white woman berating a minority. It's oh it, yeah, it comes big, out of nowhere. <laughs> big Karen energy right here. Yeah. Okay, so I brought up the the scene in Home Depot where he professes to her that he's having an affair. My note just says insane Home Depot scene. And this was the main thing I remembered from seeing it is like this movie tries to, you know, it tries to be like kind of a fun, cute, romantic comedy. And this scene is just wild, dude. It's <laughs> it's like an a real life portrayal of someone trying to pull this off. And then, you know, the acting is so like layered in this because Bradley Cooper, Ben's character was thinking that this was his way he was going to finally get out of this marriage he doesn't want to be in but he's too much of a coward to actually say that because you know uh, Jennifer Connelly is like obviously upset but she's like okay this means we have to work on things now and I don't want out of this to you and he has that moment where he just he can't do it and uh, just the back and forth between these two here it's a scene that this movie doesn't deserve but I'm grateful that we got it it's a, it's a scene that Home Depot doesn't deserve. How did, how did they land on that location? Uh, I would wager to bet a substantial amount of money that shit like that happens in Home Depot all the time. <laughs> if you're there with your significant other, that's like the peak of stress right there. <laughs> King Quop is drawing from personal experience. Yes. Aren't we going to deal with this? Don't you want to find some way for us to work through this i assume that when i told you you would want me out is that what you want no yeah, I mean, I I agree that it's a good scene. I The problem when you have these massive ensemble cast movies is that you only get a little bit of time with each character. And mm-hmm. this story, I think, more than any of the others, would have benefited from us spending a little more time with uh with all three of the characters. If the if the purpose was to make us feel bad for B Coop and uh Scarlett Johansson, you know, by the end, then I needed more time with them to where they didn't just come across as horny teenagers. Because we only see them, like, flirting and, uh, you know, post-sex or about to have sex. And then on the Jennifer Connelly side, I I was having a hard time buying why she wouldn't just 
dump this dude. Because, yes, he looks like Bradley Cooper, but she looks like Jennifer Connelly. And she seems to be as, you know, successful at her job. They don't have any kids. And she says it. Like, at some point, she's like, yeah, we haven't had sex in years. It was like, that is a major tragedy. Like, Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Connelly are married and they're not having sex. Like, that's just put an end to it, you know? And so I was surprised that she still wanted to work on it after this big Home Depot set piece. Mm-hmm. And I think that maybe if I'd had a few more scenes with her where I could understand why this marriage mattered to her, then I would have been a little more involved, more engaged in what was happening. But as it was, I'm like, you know, this is what happened throughout the entire movie. Me yelling at the characters and telling them, just get out. They Stop pursuing this. You know, just cut your losses. Move on. I said that to Jennifer Goodwin. I said that to Jennifer Connelly. I said that to Jennifer Aniston. I said that to uh, Kevin Connolly, like anybody, like at some point, like all of these people, all these characters are just too blind to move on where they should move on. And so this is a comedy, but it mostly, I find it mostly frustrating, not funny. It is you that's been smoking too, isn't it? What? Wait, what does that even matter? Later, Anna and Ben begin having sex in his office when he gropes and strips her to her lingerie. This scene I have in my notes, how was this movie PG-13? Because <laughs> there's, uh, I mean, language throughout, there's one fuck. And this is like, this is pretty intense for a PG-13 movie because he's full on. Yeah, just like grabbing her and groping her and stripping her down. And it's clear where things are going. I, I'm surprised. I thought it was Radar, actually. You no. just now opened my eyes. PG-13. That's how it made that 180 mil, baby. Yeah, that makes sense. They are interrupted by Janine, who arrives, hoping to spice up their marriage, forced to hide in a closet, and listen as Ben and Janine have sex. Anna afterwards leaves in disgust, ending her affair with Ben. Uh, Yeah, she should have beat his ass for this one, honestly. (laughs) Uh, I don't know, man. I was just like, that's what you get. How slash why does homeboy have a closet in his office? (laughs) Well, where do you want him to hide his mistresses? (laughs) Under the desk. Oh, there you go. Classy. Yeah, Costanza style. (laughs) So, so okay. So when this happened, you feel you felt bad for Scarlett Johansson because I feel bad for Jennifer Connelly. I guess she. I mean, she doesn't know what's going on either. It's. I feel bad for both of the women in this situation. Okay, so so at least we can agree that we don't feel bad for uh, Bradley Cooper. Uh, no. I don't know how I could feel bad for any man that gets to have sex with Jennifer Connelly or Scarlett Johansson. Back to back. For real. Doubling up. We forgot to mention it earlier, Julio, but yeah, Bradley Cooper doesn't do a whole lot to endear himself because when he blames the workers, he cl- he makes sure to state that they're all undocumented workers. And it's just like, <laughs> dog, you're not helping your case here. It's it, on top of that, like, how is that relevant? So if they had been documented workers, that means that they wouldn't smoke? Yeah. like, oh, they must be smoking because they're undocumented. <laughs> the only undocumented workers buy American spirits, don't you know? There you go. As Janine tidies up Ben's clothes at home, she discovers a pack of cigarettes. That bastard was lying. He was smoking the whole time and explodes in anger. When Ben returns home, Janine is gone, leaving his clothes folded on the staircase with a carton of cigarettes and a note asking for a divorce. Janine moves into an apartment to restart her life. And Anna is seen performing at an upscale nightclub. Alone, Ben buys beer at the same supermarket where he met Anna. So if nothing else, his story is cyclical, and I appreciate that. While both the women had seemed to reassess their worth and um, will be making better of themselves. So I feel it's a happy ending for the two women, uh, despite what they had to go through. Yeah, well, th- this uh, that story was depressing. If, uh, if Justin Long and Jennifer Goodwins was uh, infuriating in the way it betrayed the message of the movie, this one was just... Uh, frustrating because i it's like jennifer connelly should have moved on from the bradley cooper relationship a long time ago then there's the tale of connor anna and mary go back to kevin connelly uh and uh, scarjo as anna enjoys a close friendship with alex's friend connor though anna wants a casual relationship connor misinterprets her playful affection as romantic interest and his friend Mary Harris, who works in advertising sales for a local gay newspaper and helps Connor promote his real estate business. That was kind of surprising. We did get a little bit of like your 90s homophobia in a movie in 2009 from Kevin Connolly. 
where his ad is in the gay newspaper and he has some I don't know fucking moral objection or something to it. It's like fucker, you're an entourage. Calm down. <laughs> uh, this is the the part of the story, the part of the movie that features Wilson Cruz. It's mostly a background role, but I was geeking out that he was there, and then I was deeply disappointed that the movie never gave him anything to do. He is one of the the gay friends, co-workers, Drew Barrymore's. Uh, okay. The guy with the beard. Uh, he's, he's Hispanic. Yeah, he looks familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if, you're, if your brains has still retained anything that, from when you watched, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes of Rent years and years ago, he plays uh, Angel one of the main characters and yeah, he has a career. I mean, you know, he's on uh, Star Trek discovery. Now he plays a doctor in there, but this is obviously before he was, at least I think before he was TV's Wilson Cruz or, you know, film Wilson Cruz. He's probably, you know, when he was casting this movie, he was just like a Broadway star, which was different medium. Right. Uh, kind of a shame that you didn't get to see him do more. You know, he's just almost indistinguishable from the other two or three lackeys that Drew Barrymore has there. And in a movie that could have really used more diversity <laughs> in its casting, you know, it's like you have Wilson Cruz already. Why don't you give him something to do? So it's not just uh, uh, Louis Guzman kind of like carrying the burden of being, <laughs> of not being white in this movie. Uh, so yeah, that was, that's my main takeaway when it comes to the Drew Barrymore scenes. Um, that and the fact that there is, an incredibly dated MySpace running joke. He MySpaced me. Ouch. Oh. Oh, girl, I don't know about that. My trampy little sister says MySpace is a new booty call. Oh, yeah. Well, the the whole bit with Mary, Drew Barrymore, is her aversion and just her uh, struggle with technology. We get to a scene that, uh, of her explaining, you know, now to ask someone out, you have to email them and then check your BlackBerry and then go on MySpace and then text them. And <laughs> it's when text messaging was still kind of a novelty. So we get that. Um, now, with Mary, uh, like Gigi, she meets many men, mostly online. But despite constantly monitoring her emails, pager, phone and MySpace messages, her dates go nowhere. There is a really funny scene where she gets a call back from a, a singer she went on a date with. Uh, who sings to her using her name, Mary. And then he accidentally called her back and left a voicemail for a Jenny and begins doing the same thing. It's tremendous. <laughs> Drew Barrymore deserves better. And she gets better because she straightens out fucking E <laughs> later on. <laughs> While Connor attempts to cultivate a gay clientele, two gay men explain how he is going wrong with Anna. Yeah, we get some uh, gay lessons here from <laughs> our happenstantial gay characters. <laughs> Those gentlemen may be gay in real life, but I just mean for the purposes of this movie that <laughs> happens substantially. I don't think, I mean, call me a skeptic, call me cynical, but I don't think that it works like that. The way that they simplify, like, boil down the, the how it is when you're gay, like, there's no way that it's that easy. They're like, oh, yeah, when you're gay, you're just going to, like, either hold somebody's stare for three seconds, that means that you're on, or you break away after two seconds, that means that you're not interested. It's as simple as that. There is no way. I, I that, that seems like a straight man <laughs> writing a very simplified version of what it's like to be a gay man looking for love. Shame on you, Quapis. <laughs> Honestly, we may not have the best insight. Gay signals have nothing to do with straight signals. He's right. The, the signals are totally different. Well, we did have uh, the screenplay was by Abby Cohn and Mark Silverstein, so at least we had a split perspective here. Taking their advice, Connor declares his love to Anna. Feeling vulnerable after falling out with Ben, Anna agrees to a more serious relationship. When Connor later proposes buying a house and moving in together, Anna admits she does not want to, and they return to being just friends. How, how hard did you cringe when he uh, told her about the house and how he was hoping she would move in at some point? And they'd been, I guess, officially dating for like maybe two days. Yeah, that part was pretty rough because, you know, as looking in from the outside, you know that she doesn't really feel that way about him. She's just like, you know, on the rebound, which is a real thing. You have like your or when you're younger, at least you have your on again, off again that you kind of just retreat back to when something doesn't go right. And in this case, it got too real for uh, Scar Joe and she's just like, nah, I'm out. I wonder if this would work better for me if I had if I would have more sympathy for for uh, the 
Kevin Connolly character if it wasn't Kevin Connolly, if it was somebody more sympathetic, not somebody that comes with all the baggage of entourage and like bro <laughs> humor. <laughs> so I'm like, good. <laughs> you, you don't deserve this. Scarlett Johansson may be the worst person in this movie, but it's not like you deserve any happiness, Kevin Connolly. So good that she rejected your dumb offer of <laughs> her moving into a house that you are planning to buy. So it's just like dumb characters all around here. Play stupid games. Yep. Mary later runs into Connor, recognizing him from his ad and having only spoken to him over the phone. They hit it off and start dating. I mean, Connor and Mary were like the two quirky characters in this. It it, it kind of uh, is funny that he goes for her, but not Gigi, considering they're so similar. But it it provides a happy ending for it. And you got to have Drew Barrymore step up to bat to hit the home run. So it's a, it's a perfect way to – this is kind of one of the things that ends the movie. And I think it ends it on a perfect note. Yeah. I mean, uh, you didn't even see the make out. They save that for the Justin Long, Jennifer Goodwin ending. Yes. <laughs> Drew Barrymore only sits at the table with, uh, with E and they just talk about her voice. And I was like, really? Drew Barrymore is arguably, at least at the time that this movie came out, arguably a bigger star than or the other female uh, leads, right? Wouldn't you say? Yeah, at the time this was released... Uh, hmm, mm, 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 mm. It'd be her, Jennifer Aniston, and Ben Affleck would be the three biggest names. Yeah, and she gets the least amount of screen time. Could they not afford her? <laughs> she was a producer on this, so maybe it was just kind of like, yeah, I'll pop in every once in a while and do what I want to do. <laughs> I'll come in and check in on everybody else. And she's behind the scenes just wrangling all the actors. <laughs> yeah, she's like, all right, so this is your motivation in this scene. <laughs> And then finally, we have Beth and Neil. Beth, of course, uh, Miss Rachel Green herself, Jennifer Aniston. Gigi's co-worker, Beth Murray, lives with her boyfriend, Neil, a friend of Ben's. After seven years together, Beth wants to get married, but Neil opposes marriage. Gigi announces she will no longer misinterpret vague gestures and comments and says that men who delay marrying likely never intend to. This spurs Beth to confront Neil who remains adamant that he never wants to marry and she breaks up with them. Have you ever known someone that was just adamantly opposed to marriage? Uh, yes. Uh, that person was me. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, which is why... For the same reasons as Ben Affleck? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, same ballpark. Uh, look, I mean, we'll get more into... When we talk, when we get to real talk, we will we'll talk about my side of the story. But as somebody who a hundred percent understands where the Ben Affleck character is coming from, you know, I thought that he was making very rational points, and I'm like, you know, I have this belief, and these are my reasons why I believe this, mm -hmm. and uh, we can have a discussion. But I think that I'm on pretty solid ground. So he lays out a complete like presentation <laughs> he does a ted talk about why he doesn't want to get married to jennifer aniston jennifer aniston reacts in the opposite way she doesn't explain anything other than why well, i don't like it i want to get married <laughs> i couldn't tell you why but i want to so she meets his rationality with emotion and he can't win against that i mean you can't like argue bullshit come on Bullshit for every woman that has been told by some man that he doesn't believe in marriage. And then six months later, he's married to some 24-year-old that he met at a gym. It's just, it's bullshit. So he basically gets kicked out of his house because Jennifer Aniston decided that, uh, logic be damned, I just want to get married because my, my sister is getting married. So I thought it was cool at first that the movie was going to kind of teach Jennifer Aniston a lesson, right? You had a good man. <laughs> and, and you let all this bullshit get to your head. And and now look at the, you know, the people that are married are miserable. And you let the one good guy go because he didn't want to get married. You that know? would be like, uh, they should have made this like Lewin Davis where basically everyone, Jennifer Goodwin befriends, like everything gets fucked up for them. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, you know, it's even more powerful when you contrast it with uh, the Jennifer Connelly story, because, you know, she's married to maybe the worst husband in that city, you know, mm -hmm. Bradley Cooper cheating on her, lying to her, smoking, smoking shitty cigarettes. It's just <laughs> Ben Affleck is a saint and he gets kicked out. And I'm like, all right, well, this is obviously going to go to where 
Jennifer Aniston recognizes the error of her ways and at the end takes him back. She does. And then the movie the movie betrays Affleck and has him break you know, he suddenly flips and he's like, uh, you know what, just kidding. All those reasons I listed for not wanting to get married. It doesn't matter. You know what? We need a happy ending. And this is Hollywood. So the only way that this story really has a happy ending is if we get married, if there's a wedding. And so they betray his character. He absolutely changes his point of view and decides to get married with Jennifer Anderson. How does that make any sense, Alex? How how does that... Didn't that make you feel betrayed alongside uh, Ben Affleck's beliefs that he ended up caving? Uh, you're leaving out a massive part of the story here. One, it's that Chris Christopherson is Rachel's dad in this movie. My note just says, Chris Christopherson, what on earth? Because I completely <laughs> forgot about that. <laughs> Preparations for her younger sister's wedding reopen the issue after Beth hears backhanded comments from the various family members. During the reception, her father, Ken, Chris Christopherson, suffers a heart attack. Beth cares for him as he recuperates at home while her sisters wallow and their husbands remain glued to the television with constant takeout food. Beth's patience wanes and the house grows more dysfunctional, but Neil arrives with groceries and helps with chores. They reconcile with Beth assuring Neil that she wants him back without being married. Neil later proposes and they wed aboard his sailboat. So you left out the massive thing of mortality coming into play with the the dad having a heart attack in the sense of just like that really makes you rethink things. And it did from both vantage points. <laughs> but I think that the right thing was done in the end where Ben Affleck, you know, gave her what she wanted and their love will be eternal. They just want to be together and it was the right thing for them to do. So I think you leaving out the mortality does a, a really big disservice to that aspect that, uh, quadrant of the movie um, okay so first i have a question how did ben affleck show up just to do the dishes like who called him well i imagine given the circumstances no one at the house is paying attention to shit he probably just snuck in the back door and started knocking out the dishes that were in the sink right but, but how does he how did he know to like just show up he was away from civilization he was living on his boat <laughs> he was robert redford and all hope is lost <laughs> yes <laughs> did he happen? Did he get a, a, a Yahoo alert? An Amber Haven't alert? Haven't you seen Forrest Gump, dude? The the they have CBs on there. Forrest, you got to oh. come home. Your mom's sick. <laughs> yeah, Chris Christopherson just collapsed. Yes, <laughs> Ben and Affleck just jumps into the water. Yes, damn it, he beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Sinise is on there. Like, where are you going? <laughs> I gotta save Baba. Well, okay, that's that's problem number one. Uh, problem number two, and be, even forget about the ending. Okay, clearly we're going to disagree here because I, you, you respect the sanctity of marriage in a way that I do not. Uh, when it comes to like you know whether you force a man to do it or not, but I think that the biggest crime this movie commits is that it cast Jennifer Aniston, one of the greatest comedians of our time, a bad actress. <laughs> but, why isn't she being funny here? Why did why did they give her the one character that doesn't have any funny moments? She gets the sad story. All she does is mope around, first because Affleck won't propose, then because she doesn't have a date to her sister's wedding, and then because her dad's dying. It's just it, what it be happened? that way sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But it's like as a can you imagine you go to see that movie with Rachel from Friends and Every time that she, the, the story, her story comes around, it's like, oh no, what's going to happen now? <laughs> she has to walk down the aisle with the dog at the wedding. Yep. Come on. And also, I mean, okay, Alex, like I said, you know, clearly we, we don't see eye to eye when it comes to Rachel's talent, or Jennifer Aniston's, but are you really going to tell me that Jennifer Aniston is just sitting right there next to you? Asking you to marry her, and you're gonna play hard to get like Affleck does here. Like I agree with his reasoning, but no, but I'm also not Ben Affleck, so oh, I can't pull that off. <laughs> I mean, Affleck is kind of playing down his Afflickness in this movie because B Coop was was established as the sex symbol of this. Okay, B Coop and Justin Long, like Ben Affleck <laughs> is trying to play like the everyman here. Oh, he's just a good guy, you know. He hangs the paintings. 
He's unkempt. He doesn't shower when he's in his boat. The movie ends with a voiceover from Gigi about, you know, trusting your instincts. There's someone out there for you. You'll find love. And then ends it with the line of never give up hope. (laughs) So pretty easy for all these really hot people to say. (laughs) Also, just a very toxic message. I think that maybe sometimes you should give up hope. (laughs) Just move on with your life. I'm a firm believer that love kind of finds you. You don't just go looking for love. And this movie is all about encouraging people to go looking for love. And Mm -hmm. fine, you know, we can have, we can disagree. Like Quapis and I can disagree on like what's the best way to go about finding a relationship. But from a movie point of view, from like a film point of view, I think that we have, way too many movies that argue this point and not enough movies that argue against it. So I would have liked to see this ensemble piece from so-called visionary filmmaker Quinn Quapis take the opposite stance and just go like, listen, it's in the title. He's just not that into you. (laughs) You know, move on. Instead, the movie ends up saying, he's just not that into you, but he might. So keep keep hoping. (laughs) Come on. Just keep trying. (laughs) Keep trying. All you have to do is look like Jennifer Goodwin. It's hard to focus on nutmeg when the guy who might or might not be the guy of my dreams refuses to call me. All right, Julio. I think that we've done our due diligence with the the contrarian perspective, so you ready to move it on to Real Talk? Let's go to Real Talk. Real Talk. 